last week we had a we, we started a, a new ser- sermon series or message, and it's, it was entitled "What Harvest Will You Produce?" What harvest will you produce? And, and and that title should give you hope because it doesn't say what harvest have you produced or what have you done lately. It says what what is in store. What what is what is God still calling you to produce? Uh, and we talked a little bit of how you can pr- produce some good things in your life and you can produce some things that are maybe not so good. Uh, but either way, you're producing something, whether you want to or not. And, and we can be a blessing or our lives can sometimes be a curse. And so I, I pray everybody in here would say, hey, no, my, my life is going to produce some good things. I'm going to bear good fruit that's going to be a blessing uh, for other people. And uh, so I'm excited. Even as we were praying this morning here, uh, Brother Juan uh, led the prayer, and he said something in that prayer. He says, let, let, a, let this house not be filled with complaints, but let it be com- filled with praise. <clears throat> and it's when we're in his presence that he's able, if we make room, as the song said, he's able to take our complaints and our frustrations, which many times are valid and real, but he's able to turn those things if we make room, and it becomes our worship and our praise. And so I'm thankful uh, to God for that. And Today we're going to dive into Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9, and uh, this, this chapter, if you go back and read this chapter, there's so much going on in this chapter, and uh, you don't have to put up, pull, pull up the scripture yet. Uh, before I read the scripture, I want to give you a little bit of background, and I would just challenge you even this week to go back and read uh, Matthew chapter 9, it's the first book of the New Testament, and in the beginning of this chapter, we see that Jesus heals a paralyzed man. Uh, and not only does he heal him, but he forgives him of his sin. Uh, and I'm so thankful that that, that that same Jesus that forgave his, his, this man's sin in chapter 9 is the same one who has given me hope and has given me grace and has forgiven my sins. Is there anybody else in the house who's thankful for the forgiveness of sin and, uh, and healing as well? And so in the beginning, he heals this man who's paralyzed. And uh, it's the same story where these, his, his friends, his three friends, they bring him uh, to Jesus, and they can't get in the house, and they have to dig a hole through the ceiling, through the roof to get this paralyzed man down there. And, and Jesus is schooling some people. He's schooling the Pharisees, so he not only forgives this man's sin, but then he, he heals him in the beginning. As you keep reading, you'll see that he calls Matthew to be his disciple in chapter 9. Uh, he schools John the Baptist's disciples in chapter 9. Um, he introduces the gospel by talking about new wineskins, and, and you can go back and read the chapter. I'm not going to dive into that. Just, it's such a powerful chapter that I'm, I'm giving you a little glimpse of, of everything else that it talks about. He, in this chapter, it talks about the woman with the issue of blood who gets healed as Jesus is going to, to meet somebody else's need. Uh, this woman is desperate for healing uh, after suffering for this, from this issue of blood for for most of her life, and she, she dives in, and she goes after Jesus, and she finds healing. Um, and then Jesus gets to that, that home, and he raises this young uh, girl who's dead, and he raises her back to life. And uh, after that, he heals two blind men, and he's doing all this stuff, and, and it continues. After that, he, he delivers a man, uh, or he frees a man who's possessed by demons. Uh, and when he does that, he starts getting accused uh, by, the, by the religious people. And then we get to the last four verses in chapter 9, and that's what we're going to focus on here. And, and again, go back and read the chapter and, and take your time reading it, and you can reference some other uh, gospels when you, when you read that. But at the last part of this, uh, of this scripture, uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 through 38, and you could, you could bring the scripture up now. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Say compassion. Because they were harassed, helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So we see Jesus is, is, is now, he's, he's performing all these miracles. And in the midst of, of miracles and healings and deliverances, and, and, and it says every disease is getting healed. And, uh, and, and in the midst of all this, he has compassion on the people. 
Why? Because they're harassed, they're helpless, they're sheep without a shepherd. And then he goes and he, and he finishes this chapter by challenging the disciples, letting them know that there's a great harvest, but that there's, work, that there's few workers. And then he says, pray uh, that there will be more workers sent into this great harvest field. And I, I believe that this challenge to the disciples is the same challenge that we have today. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how can we become some of those workers who, who go get the harvest, who go share the good news of Jesus. Uh, and, and, and being raised in church all my life, sometimes we get comfortable. We get comfortable. And, um, and we, we, um, we, we, we come to church and we could get so comfortable that we, we forget that God's mission is to reach lost people. And we lose sight of his mission and we get caught up with our mission. Y'all with me? Yeah. All right. All right. Yes, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So we see Jesus going into these communities, and he has compassion. And he's having compassion because the people are lost, because they're being harassed by the devil, by their neighbor. Uh, they're being harassed maybe by their own insecurities. How many know that we could get harassed by our own garbage? And, and, he, and he says they're helpless, Jesus says. So it sounds, could sound very familiar to the world we live in right now. And I, I believe many people were, were walking in different directions but had no direction. Uh, and so all of a sudden Jesus has compassion. And, and as I, I read this, I thought about where does this compassion come from? Where is this compassion that he's experiencing? Uh, where is it from? And I believe that the compassion he was experiencing, it comes from the heart of the Father. Because God has compassion. Because God so loved the world, he sends his son. There's this compassion in the Father for you and for me. And, and you can compare that compassion to his grace. But Jesus is experiencing this compassion because it is God's love for people. Not just saved people, but for lost people, for young people, for uh, older people, for all people. God has compassion. And this compassion is flowing through Jesus, and he's performing miracles, and he's doing these great things, but he still has this great sense of compassion, understanding that there's people who are lost, there's people being harassed, there's people, and he compares them to sheep without a shepherd. Are y'all still with me today? I believe that this same compassion that is flowing through Jesus, uh, that came from the heart of the Father, we need that compassion today. I, I need that compassion in my life. Where we get so caught up with our, on our task list and the things we have to do that we, we lose sight of, of the mission of God and we miss out on the compassion of the Father. Sometimes we end up doing our own thing and instead of doing his thing. And we want so much for him to be involved in our thing when he's saying, could you be involved in my thing? So then I could take care of your thing. Uh, and, and I believe this is a message for all of us, myself included. I, I think this is key, but, but where does this compassion come from? And, and as you look at the scriptures, you look at the gospels, you see that Jesus would find time to be with the Father. And that's where the compassion comes from. He's spending time with the Father. The Bible will say many times that he would get up early and go alone to be with the Father. There's this intimacy, there's this relationship uh, that, that, is, that, is, that is happening, that is stirring between Jesus and his father, where all of a sudden it is through that intimacy that the compassion is born. And I believe that that is key for us, that we need to take time to, to not just have a shallow relationship with God, but that it will become a deeper relationship, a more intimate relationship with the Father that then makes room for some compassion. It makes room for his mission to become our mission. I know I'm preaching to myself. I hope somebody else is getting this too. But I believe it's taking time to be with the Father that then makes room for this compassion, and it comes from God's heart. It is a deep interaction uh, that, 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 that will lead us to what? Share the gospel. It leads us to share the good news of Jesus and not just hold it in, not just be selfish with it. But there is such an intimacy uh, between Jesus and the Father that all of a sudden, everywhere he goes, people get healed. Everywhere he goes, people get delivered. Everywhere he goes, hope arises. Everywhere he goes, some people who are foggy now have clarity. And I believe that same spirit that he carries is inside of you. It's inside of me. 
but we need a little more intimacy. We got to get a little deeper uh, with, our, with our relationship with the Lord. And, and it's good, it's amazing that we make our, our way to church, but he's saying, I need a little more. If you just make a little more. And what does that look like? Maybe it's getting up a little bit earlier and walking around the block and having a conversation with the Father. Maybe it's before, before you, you put the car in drive, you would have a conversation with the Father. And maybe it's in the shower, right, where, where, where before you, you take all the soap off of your hair, you say, Father, here I am, all soapy. Can we have a conversation? But it is being intentional and making room for the Holy Spirit to lead us to the compassion of the Father. How many want to be a little more compassionate today? I believe it is that very compassion that leads to the harvest. It is that harvest that we're going to produce. And if we spend all of our time focusing on our woes and the issues that we have because we all have them, if we spend all of our time just focusing on us, then we lose sight of his mission and we miss out on his compassion, not just for our lives, but for my neighbor and the guy across the street and the girl at work, where all of a sudden uh, their conversation becomes our conversation. Instead of our conversation becoming their conversation. Can somebody praise him because he's good? But I believe that your harvest, the harvest that you, pro that you produce, it, it's determined by your relationship with God. What does that relationship look like? Is it a shallow Relationship, if it's a shallow relationship, and what I mean by that, it means that maybe we just come to church and we come and we worship, but we're not really here to give him worship. We're here to receive a blessing. And it can become a shallow relationship where we're doing things, maybe in church or out of church, so that someone will recognize us, not because of who he is. And those are shallow relationships that then lead to frustration, and it leads you to places, some dark Places. Has anybody else been in a dark place where you feel alone? I'll tell you, why don't you go a little bit deeper with him? Go a little bit deeper with him. And, and, and so if you have a shallow re relationship, it means a little harvest. If you go uh, have a deep relationship, then it means a plentiful harvest. And Jesus says that the harvest is plentiful. But he's looking for some people who go a little deeper. Take a little more time uh, to be with him. So that then we can go... And then we could reap, and, and we could bring in that harvest. How many know there's some people in our neighborhoods who need Jesus? How many know that we still need some more of Jesus? Amen. Praise him. And, and I want to just touch on the prophet Isaiah because he has this experience with God's glory that, that, that would, would lead him to, to make himself available. And I know all of us want to make ourselves, I believe that in, deep down inside, all of us want to make us, ourselves available uh, to God. But let's see what happens with Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, we won't go through verse 1. We're going to start at verse 5. It says this. This is Isaiah speaking. He says, then I said, it's all over. I am doomed. Maybe some of us have said this before. It's all over. I'm doomed for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's army. Then one of the seraphim, which is an angel, then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal. He had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Verse 8 says this, then I heard the Lord asking, whom shall I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. How many want those words to come out of their mouth, out of their spirit? Here I am, send me. How, how does this happen here? Uh, I, I see that Isaiah finds himself in this position. If you go back and read the chapter, verses 1 through 4, it talks about how he finds himself in the glory of God. He's experiencing, and it is in God's glory that he realizes, I am doomed. I'm filthy lips I have. I'm sinful. And this is the prophet of God. So if it's the prophet of God, it means there's hope for you and there's hope for me. But he finds himself literally in the presence of God. And I want to remind you, church, because we forget, but when you are in the presence of God, something has to happen. 
something has to shift. And in Isaiah's case, it says that he will be transformed never to be the same again. He comes to realization that he's a sinful man. He says, it's all over, I'm doomed. He says, the filthy lips, and I live around a bunch of people with filthy lips. But in spite of his realization of his sin, God provides grace and forgiveness. I'm so thankful for his grace and forgiveness. That when I was at the worst of my worst, when I was ready to take my own life, when I had given up on everybody, I had given up on myself, I gave up on God, he still sent his grace and he sent what? Hope. Hope. And so he sends his grace, he sends his forgiveness. This angel comes over and puts this coal on his mouth and all of a sudden he's transformed. And, 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 and God has done the same thing when he sent not an angel with a coal, but he sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross and by his grace, you can be saved. By his grace, all of a sudden, you, his compassion, his love, his goodness can flow through your life. I'm so thankful. So this is what happens in the presence of the Lord. All of a sudden, when you're in the presence of the Lord, your heart begins to reflect his heart. What else happens? His priorities become your priorities. His love, you get access to it, and his love becomes your love. And his perspective becomes your perspective. His desires become your desires. And we become people who, who are transformed by the presence of God and by his word. And all of a sudden we get to say, we get to say, taste and see that the Lord is good. All of a sudden we, we begin to see things differently. And we see that in the, in the midst of him, uh, of, of Isaiah Coming to grips with his sin, he finds forgiveness, he finds grace from God, and not only does he find this, but when, as he finds this, something starts bubbling up on the inside, and he can't hold it back. So when God said, whom shall we say? Who shall we send? He says, here I am. Here I am. I'm no longer that filthy, dirty man that, I just, that was right here two seconds ago. All of a sudden, his grace, there's been this intimate thing that happened inside of him that all of a sudden he could not hold on. And he screams out, knowing he was not worthy, he screams out, here I am, send me. And I believe that God has that same call for your life that despite and in spite of our sin, in spite, he says, experience me and then you can go. How many want to do something different this year? I want to do something different. I want to do the same thing and be in the same place I was two years ago, three years, five years from now. Yeah, we're doing Extend Conference, but if God wants to do something different, let's do something different. If he wants 10 campuses, let's do 10 campuses. If he wants two campuses, let's do two campuses. If he wants me to move to Florida, I'm going to move to Florida, not because I want to, but because I have said, here I am. Send me. What do you want, God? You have redeemed a broken soul. You have given a, a dead man life. It's no longer me that lives, but it is Christ in me. Right? And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, our complaints just dissipate. Say, God, yeah, it was all, all hell broke loose, but you were there. Yeah, I felt alone, but it was a lie. You never left me. You never forsook me. And I want to be like Isaiah. Here I am, God. And I believe that in chapter 9 of Matthew, Jesus makes the same call. He said, there's a plentiful harvest, but there's not enough workers. He says, pray, pray to the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send more workers. I'm telling you, church, he's looking for workers. He's looking for people who will go a little bit deeper with him. He's looking for this deep interaction with him that would then bring, right, the call of your life will come to life as you spend time with the giver of life. He's a faithful God. He's a faithful God. And I just want to end with this because time is running. But I, I want to just give you some hints. There's three ways we interact with, interact with God. Three ways we interact with God. Or three main ways. And the first one, the first way that we interact with God, interact with God is through thanksgiving. It's our response to what God has done. So thanksgiving is our gratefulness being expressed to God. So, and then the Bible said we're supposed to give thanks at all times. 
And so there's those moments that we say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you for not forgetting me. Thank you for whatever he's done for you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, God, because I should be dead and I'm alive. Thank you, God, because I have another uh, day of life. Thank you because I woke up this morning. And there's these things that were, there's this interaction, but then there's more. Because that is a thanksgiving of what he's done. The second way we interact with God is by our praise. So there's thanksgiving and then praise. Our, our praise is a response to who God is. And we see a great example in the Old Testament. Where the Bible says that Israel, God's people, they were acquainted with the acts of God. They were acquainted with, God, with what God had done. And they were not always grateful, but there was moments they were grateful, especially when God had just done it. So there's a praise that they're, they're acquainted uh, with, with what God has done or what he's able to do. But it says while the people were acquainted with the acts of God, Moses was acquainted with the ways of God. So there's a distinction there, not just what he does, but who he is. Moses has this deeper interaction with God. And I believe God is trying to take us to a deeper place on who he is. And so that when we praise him, we don't praise him just because what he did or what he can do or what we, we want him to do. We praise him because of who he is. It's a deeper place of intimacy with the Father. Y'all with me? So Israel was acquainted with the acts of God. Well, Moses was acquainted with the ways of God. The third one is this, worship. Worship. So we have thanksgiving, we have praise, and we have worship. And worship is an expression in our reverence and adoration for God. It's this place where all of a sudden we're, we're in reverence. Sometimes you may speak, sometimes you may not. And it can happen here at church. It can happen in your room. It can happen in your car where all of a sudden you're in this place of worship. It is this profound interaction between you and the one you worship. One definition for worship in the Hebrew says this. Worship is to kiss God. That's a little deeper, right? It's a little more intimate. This is being thankful. No, there's this deep interaction between you and God. And it is this awareness of God's heart. It is an awareness of God's heart that all of a sudden in that deep place of worship, just like, just like Isaiah was experiencing this deep place of intimacy, it is in that in that place of worship or deep interaction with God, that all of a sudden he gives you compassion for lost people. And not only, do you wanna, not only do you want to share the good news of Jesus, but you are drawn to lost people. The Holy Spirit begins to draw you to lost people. That people in the past who smelled to you, you didn't want to be near them. You just turned the, you turned the other cheek to get away from them. All of a sudden, because you've experienced him and there's this interaction, all of a sudden he draws you to people you never would be around before. Has anybody experienced that? So something's different. I feel called to, I would never do this. I would never, ever, ever be a blessing to this person. And it is this place of worship that, that leads us to that. It leads us to that. And I love what Bill Johnson says. Bill Johnson says, you will always become like the one you worship. And because we were created by God to worship, you are always worshiping something or somebody. Let it be him. Let it be him. Because I find even my own life where I was worshiping some things more than I was worshiping him. And you find yourself that you start to act and think like those things, whether it's money, whether it's whatever it can be, whether it's lust, whatever, whatever it is that you find yourself worshiping, you can't get out of your mind. You could, even, you could even start worshiping social media. I mean, it's crazy, but you were created to worship. So you're going to worship something or somebody. And some of us get caught up maybe worshiping our spouse or our bank account or our careers all of a sudden, you start to look and smell and act like whatever that thing is. But let it be that he would be the one that we will begin to look like. That the compassion that Jesus felt when he saw these lost people will begin to flow through his church. All of a sudden, people who 
maybe we're just sitting in church, just rise up and say, there's something more that God is calling me for, and I'm not going to miss it. And we'll be like Isaiah and say, here I am. Send me.